we are in a series of sermons on the church. The church with the big C and all the churches with little C's that make up God's church. And this morning I want us to consider what should a church do? What should a church do? Churches do all kinds of things. Churches worship and pray and serve. Churches have Bible studies and dinners together. Some churches have fancy coffee houses that rival Starbucks, I tell you. Some have lots of committees and meetings. Some churches have bingo nights. I heard of a church that started a dry cleaning service in hopes of attracting people. I know, that's what I thought too when I heard it. <laughs> I've also seen churches that have had carnivals and chili cook-offs, impressive theatrical productions. Last year when churches had to stop gathering because of COVID, churches were challenged with the question, well, what are we if we can't gather? I mean, can a church be a church if it doesn't meet? Sometimes when we speak of church, we mean uh, going to a building on Sunday morning for worship. Uh, we go to church. We, go, uh, we, we speak of church as a noun. If this building disappeared, would there still be a church called American Fork Presbyterian Church? Perhaps we should, perhaps we should speak of church as a verb. Something we do. When we worship, we are doing church. When we feed the hungry, when we serve the poor, we are doing church. When uh, we help another person or a church family in need, we are doing church. When we come together for a prayer time, we are doing church because Christ's church is an active, ministering body that lives for him. And the book of Acts is the story of the beginning of the church. And the first passage that we read, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, gives us a picture of the first community of believers. It is a succinct but very telling window into the earliest church. And it shows us how the very first Christians did church. And there are some things we can learn from this that need to guide every church still today. I want to pay careful attention to it and just walk through each one of those verses. Acts chapter 2. It begins saying they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. First we learn they were a devoted church. The word in the New Testament used for devoted is a strong word. It means obstinate persistence. Something that is ongoing. It refers to um, something that, that, that you never stop. Now, we're often devoted to what we love most. To what we love most. And it says the believers devoted themselves to four different things. First, the apostles' teaching. The apostles had seen Jesus. They had been with Jesus. They knew the story. They knew the facts. They taught the community, those first Christians, the story and the implications of what Jesus taught and what Jesus did. And those first believers fed themselves with good teaching. And good teaching keeps us straight about who we are and what we are about as followers of Jesus Christ. Second, it says they devoted themselves to fellowship. The New Testament concept of fellowship is much more than just coming together for a dinner or standing outside and talking after church. It refers to sharing life together. Biblical fellowship is, has a sense of intimacy, of mutual acceptance. It's being with one another, talking about our lives, supporting, ministering to one another. Third, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. This might refer to the Lord's Supper. 
It might refer to just common meals that they had together. It might refer to both because we know that the early Christians would have a meal before they would share in communion together and the bread and the cup. We aren't exactly sure, but it's a good bet uh, that the Lord's Supper was a part of this. Jesus told his disciples to do this and we devote ourselves to the breaking of bread today still when we share communion together. And then fourth, they devoted themselves to, it says prayer. Literally, that word means the prayers, plural. Um, there were set times of prayers at the temple, three times a day, morning, noon, and night, that people would go to. Remember, the first Christians were largely Jewish. Their practice had been to go to the temple in Jerusalem. There were also times they prayed on their own. Prayer is basic to the Christian life. It's not a luxury. It's not a side dish. It is a part of a devoted life in Christ. Four things that Acts tells us those first believers devoted themselves to with bulldog persistence. It shaped their entire church lives. Uh, I was born in Berkeley, California, and First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley is very near to the University of California campus. And some years ago, that church started a house for college students, for Christian college students. It still is there today. That house has a name. It is called 242. 242. The name comes from this verse in Acts. Chapter 242. And now that you know the verse, you can probably guess what they tried to do and how they tried to live as an intentional community in that house. It goes on, next verse, 243. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Wonders and signs are not only part of the Gospels with Jesus, but they continue in the book of Acts. Um, through the apostles, there are healings, there are direct interventions from God. Here's something we read a little later in the book of Acts. It says, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. More and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. I would love to see that. Do wonders and signs happen today? Some say, well, no, they were only for that time and those things don't happen anymore. But I believe the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ can still and still is breaking through the order we know in the universe, still showing mighty works that would astound. It's not everyday stuff. But we still hear stories. I hear stories of where God is doing wonders in people's lives today. You know, our scientific, rational worldview often places limitations on what is possible. And this morning, I'm not going to go, we're not going to go into why we don't see more wonders and signs. But I do know that an openness and an expectation with faith opens the way for God to move and to do amazing things. The God of the Bible is still God. And the purpose of the miracles of the Bible were never to put on some kind of religious show, but to witness to God's presence and power. God was doing mighty works in those first apostles. And when God moves, it's always for the purpose of people coming to faith in Him. It goes on. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Boy, we get a remarkable picture of the way people lived with one another, shared with one another, were deeply self-giving with one another. In the passage from Acts chapter 4 that we read together in unison, it says they were of one heart and mind. Did you catch that? And they shared everything they had. They testified to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was powerfully at work in them 
so that there were no needy persons. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus is connected to there being no needy persons among them. Why? Because if Jesus is risen, none of us can be the same. And one tangible sign of God's grace in a church is that people are cared for. God's grace was powerfully at work in them, making them a giving people. God's grace was powerfully at work in them, making them wildly generous. God's grace was powerfully at work in them so that they were self-sacrificing for the good of others. God's grace transforms hearts. Remember when that old tax collector Zacchaeus came to Christ? Remember that story? Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Well, what did Zacchaeus do? He gave half of his possessions to the poor and he paid back everybody that he cheated. Because he knew his salvation in Christ demanded a response with his whole life, but also with his wealth. God's grace powerfully worked in him. Followers of the Lord Jesus Christ know that he's Lord of our stuff too. And that early church knew that. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. It's said they, meet, they met together every day. So beginning tomorrow... No, no, no. <laughs> but the phrase literally means they devoted themselves with one mind. It's the same word devoted that was used in verse 42, that dogged persistence. They met together and they entered one another's homes. They shared meals, it said. They did it with glad and sincere hearts. There was a sense of generosity and open-heartedness. The people of this community, that early Christian community, they were real with one another. They were sincere. That's the word that's used to describe them. Not trying to put on a show, but sincere. And they were praising God because praise always turns us away from ourselves, our preoccupation with ourselves, and puts, turns us towards God. They were a God-centered people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Through all of this, people were coming to Christ. God was using his church to bring people to a knowledge of his grace, love, and forgiveness. They didn't take credit for those who were joining them. It was the Lord who did this. He was adding to their numbers. What we find in Acts chapter 2 is a snapshot of the Christian community, and it was a vibrant one. But we have to be careful about idealizing this. There are Christians who say, you know, we need to go back to those days. We need to look exactly like that. They say, you know, that was a pure and problem-free church. Well, as for a pure church, and you read just a couple of chapters and the problems begin. And you read the letters of the Old Testament and you find that there were problems in those first churches just as sure as there are problems in our churches today. And another reason we have to be careful about idealizing this is that there's a big difference between Palestine in the first century and the United States, that, where we live our faith in the 21st century. We don't have to carbon copy Acts chapter 2, but we certainly need to let it shape the way we do church. And what we find is a people living their faith together in the Lord Jesus Christ, because that is what a church is. That is what a church does. There is no individual Christianity. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ puts us in a community of faith with other believers. In Romans, Paul writes this. He says, in Christ, we who are many form one body. Each member belongs to the others. Christian life is not a life of separation or keeping distance. It's a life of belonging to one another. In Acts chapter 2, uh, those believers, they didn't separate themselves from one another. They came together. You know, one of the best things happening in your life right now is the people sitting around you. There are prayers from those people to be given and to be received. There are meals to be shared. Uh, there are scriptures and teachings and thoughts of faith to be talked about. There is care to be given. 
sure, we can come to worship and then we can leave ASAP or we can be intentional about being in relationship with those in our church. There is a beauty just in what happens on Sunday morning when we come to worship. Kathleen Norris, uh, the writer, also happens to be a Presbyterian Christian, wrote how when we experience really hard times in our lives, and when it's just all we can do sometimes to even breathe, she says, then it is really important to be there on Sunday morning. Because here we are with the family of faith who can keep faith for us and can pull us along in faith, whatever we're going through. Some Sundays I know we may come here like wrung out dish rags. But others are here to pick us up and help us along. And it's not limited to Sundays. Christian fellowship isn't built on the convenience of, well, we'll get together when I need it. Rather, Christian fellowship is built on the conviction that I need it for the health of my faith. I need people who will walk this journey of faith with me. I need people to support me, and I need others who I can support. Churches allow us not only to receive, but to be a place where we give ourselves to others. Churches require doing life in a way that's more than just convenient for us because church is more than about us. Healthy, working, vibrant churches are also places where you have to look to the needs of others. They are places of love and generosity and self-sacrifice and it sometimes requires giving more than receiving. You know, there's a saying, a Vietnamese saying, that in hell, people have chopsticks, but they're so long they can't reach their mouths. But in heaven, chopsticks are the same length. But in heaven, the people feed one another. I've known people who've left churches because they were in it for what they could get, not for what they could give. And when they didn't get what was good for them, they were no longer interested. They wanted to feed themselves, but they didn't want to feed anybody else. Essential to being an Acts chapter 2 church is asking, who can I love? And what needs can I meet and do it in the name of Jesus? That church came to be because of the Holy Spirit. It operated under the power of God's Spirit. It, it was a life of feeding themselves on the apostles' teaching, on praying, sharing life together, practicing deep generosity, meeting the needs of others. And these were not accomplishments of extraordinary folk. It was the signs of the Spirit of a group of people who encountered the Lord Jesus Christ, united in their purpose and in their identity, which wasn't a particular project or issue, it was found in Jesus Christ. Now there are all kinds of communities, aren't there? There are groups organized, organized around social events, uh, political agendas, civic issues, hobbies, but the church is centered around and gets its life from Jesus. And those first believers because, uh, gathered because Jesus had come alive and had given them a mission. When we aim for Jesus, our church becomes the church that God wants us to become. Acts chapter 2 verse 47 says, And they had favor with all the people. In the message translation, that verse reads, People in general liked what they saw. Some years ago, a few years back when I was pastor at Mount Olympus Presbyterian Church up in Salt Lake City, um, a woman actually said those very words to me one Sunday morning. She and her husband had been new in town. They were looking for a church. They'd been coming for several Sundays. I greeted them. I introduced myself. And they said they had just moved here. They were looking for a church. They'd been there. And she said exactly that. We like what we see. I spread my feathers out like a big peacock. I thought, wow. They joined our church, and this is the truth. In a couple of weeks, we never saw them again. I don't know what happened. 
it's probably the wrong story to tell at the end of a sermon like this, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, maybe they just didn't get what churches do. I hope people like what they see about this church. I hope that for every church. Because church isn't just a place. It's not just an event. Church is a people inhabited by the risen Lord Jesus Christ under the influence of the Holy Spirit, sharing our lives together, praising God, and doing it together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and give us a fresh filling so that we will be devoted in the growth and in the practice of our faith so that we will be a people who witness to the Lord Jesus by the way we do this life of Jesus together. We stand ready to receive your power, your blessing, your life. May our church join other churches in being a witness for your name so that people will come to know you by the way we live. Amen.